glad that you are here this morning. We greet you in the name of Jesus Christ. We have a special speaker today, special in the context of that we don't see him outside of that. He's one of those just, how many of y'all know that the, the, there's an old proverb that talks about good preaching, good preaching should comfort the afflicted and afflict the comfortable. Look over at your neighbor and say, which one are you today? Uh, good preaching or to comfort the afflicted or afflict the comfortable. You're going to get a good dose of both today. Maybe a little more on the afflicting the comfortable kind of a thing today. How many of y'all know the best place on the face of the earth to be is where God's called you? And so that's where you want to be. That's what you want to be involved in and doing those things there. Um, so that's next week's mission, uh, beginning getting prepared for Uganda. Uh, be some neat stuff. We're going to do some medical mission. We're working... Uh, Dr. Shaw is working with us, and, and some others will be working along. He's not going on the trip, I don't think, but he, he's going to help uh, get some things set up for us. And um, we're going to be ministering. I'll be ministering to some pastors that while we're there, looking forward to that. And then uh, we're also going to be doing some, uh, some, some uncontaminated water, some fresh water uh, work while we're there, as well as some other things, too. So anyway, those are some of the things that we'll be doing there. Before we have Mackenzie come up this morning and begin with the word, I want to uh, have you begin to pray. One month from now, uh, we will host our second minister's conference. And I'm really excited about that. It is a powerful opportunity to not just influence uh, one congregation or to bring about that. Um, there is a young pastor. How many of y'all heard about Andrew uh, Stocklin uh, in California about two weeks ago? Young pastor in his 30s that committed suicide. Terrible terrible thing he'd been on sabbatical i think if i read the article correctly like about four months and uh come back from sabbatical work just a, a, a few weeks and uh just decide listen the pressure and the stress and and stuff is, is too much we have one objective this this congregation i love you guys you're the givenest bunch the the prayingest bunch warriors battle and so here, I want you to engage this battle with us. We, we come together in agreement. There's so much power when we're in unity. We're stronger together. And so what God has laid on our hearts, uh, especially for Marsha and I in this kind of this last quarter of our ministry, uh, and Beth, thank you for the encouragement. I, Marsha was talking about that last week, about we're kind of, you know, me and D.L. kind of in this fourth quarter of our ministry. Beth leaned up to me and said, but God may have you go into overtime. <laughs> I'm all right with overtime. That'd be okay. So thank you for an encouraging word. Yeah, we keep having birthdays, but we ain't done yet. So that's all, that's all right. We have a desire. We believe God has called us to touch the lives of pastors. And here's, here's, the, here's the thought. Here's the philosophy of that. Bless pastors, bless their congregations. Bless congregations, bless their communities, and bless communities change the world. And that's, that's the simplicity of it. And we just want to be a part, uh, an agent of that blessing. So as these pastors and, and ministers gather here, last year in our first maiden voyage of this, we said, let's just pray, God, and you send us. And we had 50 that showed up, and for three days we just blessed and we sowed into them and and, and so thank you for that. Would you, before we, we're a month out, would you, before we move on in this service, would you pray with me and agree that those that come and are in attendance this, this next month, God just bless their hearts. We've had two pastors that was in attendance um, last year, sat right in this sanctuary. One of them, Brad Heron's dad, Butch, you know Dave, has preached here behind, behind this pulpit. Uh, two of them died with heart attacks. And some of the things that sided with stress and pressure, there needs to be, if there was ever a time, there needs to be a voice of God spoken in the world. We need men and women of God. And listen, you don't have to be called to the pulpit. You are the children of God. And whether you go all the way around the world or whether God calls you to go across the street, how many of y'all know you need to embrace what God has called you to do, to speak that word of life, to speak that word of truth to whoever you have the opportunity to do that with. What an honor and what a privilege. And when you speak that word, the word of God is powerful. Anybody agree with that? The power of the word. And so when you speak that word, literally life is going into dead situations. Light is going into dark places. And so just because, now listen to me, just because you're a pastor doesn't mean I'm anointed to preach it. I've got to live it just like you do. 
Huh? I got to live it off of my knees. I got to live it in before God, and I got to stay hooked up, or I don't make it either. Amen. Been doing this a while, and so would you join with me in this agree that we just pour out blessing upon those men, women of God who will be here that we have opportunity to minister to in a month. Let's pray. Father God, thank you. As we prepare to move on, Lord God, in this service this morning, we realize that you have opened some, some fantastic doors before this congregation. It's a little small church in Willow Springs, Missouri, Lord God. But it doesn't mean small churches can't have big impact, Father God. We can't do powerful things with your anointing and with your power, Lord God. We want to step fearlessly into those places that you lead us to, that you guide us to. Father, in a month there will be a group of ministers, pastors, evangelists, missionaries that will gather here. Lord God, we want them to be blessed. We want to just sow into their life. We know that we can do a few things materially, but Lord God, it is your anointing that destroys the yokes of bondage. Some will come in and they're so exhausted. Some will come in and they are so stressed. Dear God, we think about this young family, the dad, the husband, in his 30s. And he took his own life under the stress and the pressure and the weight of ministry, Lord God. We, we want to we take your yoke upon us. Your yoke, Lord God, your burden is light. Father God, so often we get things all mixed up and we take too much upon ourselves, Lord God. Things we were never intended to carry. Lord God, let us be a blessing as a church congregation. Remind us to be in prayer about the minister's conference in October, the trip to Uganda in March. We thank you for the word ministered today. Thank you, Lord God, for those that are watching online. May your presence and your spirit be as powerful there, that workplace, at home, wherever they are at. Lord God, would you touch them there? We give you praise. We give you thanks. Speak to us concerning our calling. Call us out of the comfort zone, Lord God, to step in to what you have prepared for us. We give you praise and we give you thanks. In Jesus' name, everyone who agreed said amen. Make this guy welcome as he comes. Welcome home. We love you. Welcome back. Give him a hand clap as he comes. Make him welcome. Amen. You got your mic? Yeah, you're on. All right. All right. Bob's class. Dismissed. Teens, you are over here today. Teens, you're here today. Oh, it might go into Bob's Our class. Youth, yeah, Bob's class is Bob's awesome. Bob's class fun. Dude, Bob's awesome. Is. It's like... Bob is Middle awesome. Middle school is going across. Is okay, on? correction. Middle school is going. <clears throat> it's on. I just have the volume up yet. Okay. Yeah. yeah it's on. Okay. Can you guys hear me through this? Hey, Justin, give give. <laughs> what? <laughs> give him just a little bit of volume on his <laughs> what? mic, please. Thank you. <laughs> All right. So, is it on now? Yep. It's good to be home. I love coming home. No matter where my family's at in this world, yeah. this right here is home to us. And. And even speaking more directly, I don't mean like Willow Springs, Willow Springs rocking, but just this building, these people, this is, is our home. So I just, um, it's awesome to be here. Uh, I'm so encouraged by every one of you. Um, the things we're going to dive into today, I want to make sure that I'm humbly putting myself under you. I'm not coming from a place of uppity uppity, okay? Because this, this message will start out very, very elementary which is what we have to build it to be because there has to be things in place before God can even call you to truly where he's wanting to call you. So as you grow as a Christian, God is going to give you callings. He's going to give you purpose, give you visions. And one thing I have learned, and this is complete truth, you can't argue with this. If you argue with it, then you just you lose the argument. <laughs> that if the vision or the calling is not intimidating, that it is an insult to God. And we will dive straight into that earlier. So check it out. I'm calling you out that are you where you're supposed to be? Because, see, I don't know that. 
I know if I'm where I'm supposed to be because God has his divine anointing, purpose, and calling upon my life. And I find that out by seeking the face of God. I find that out by intensely like engaging with Christ. But for you, I have no clue where you're supposed to be. But you, if you're intentionally seeking out Christ, you'll know if you're where you're supposed to be. So again, are you where you're supposed to be? I don't know, but you should know. So moving on. Determine the relationship. Genesis 3, 6 through 10, when the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for eating and pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate it. The eyes of both of them were opened and they realized they were naked, so they covered themselves up. Then the man and his wife heard the sound of God as he was walking through the garden in the cool of day, and they hid from who? They hid from God. So moving on, what is it about your relationship that allows you to so easily disobey, to so easily disengage with God? What is it about that relationship for you that allows you to do that? For Eve, it was something that was pleasing to her eye. She saw the apple and thought, hmm, but then also who told her that she would gain wisdom? Satan, right? right? So she ate the fruit because of what was pleasing to her. See, the crazy thing is, is we all think we have a better plan for our life than God actually does. So flip to, and it's, I'm kind of being ornery. So there are some texts that I will have up here, but then some I actually wanted to be super intentional about. Awesome, you got your Bibles. About you guys flipping to and reading it. So Mark 10 Verse 17 through 31. And again, this is going to be stuff that you guys have heard, that you guys know. But what I do challenge you to do is to not allow yourself to approach the text, to approach this word with a pre-understanding. Because anything in life that you approach and you already think you know everything about it, what it does is it rids you of becoming more effective and more efficient, right? It hinders you because you cease to grow. So let's approach this text as like it's brand new, right? All right, so check it out. Mark 10, 17 through 31. As Jesus started on his way, a man ran up to him, fell on his knees before him. Good teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Christ says, why do you call me good? Jesus answered, no one is good except God alone. You know the commandments, you shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not give false testimony, you shall not defraud, honor your father and mother, Teacher, he declared, all these have I kept since I was a boy. Jesus looked at him and loved him. One thing you lack, he said, go sell everything you have and give it to the poor. And then you will have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. At this, the man's face fell. He went away sad because he had great wealth. Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, how hard is it for rich to enter the kingdom of God. The disciples were amazed at his words, but Jesus said again, Children, how hard is it to enter the kingdom of God? It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. Then the disciples, even more amazed, and said to one another, Who then can be saved? Jesus looked at them and said, With man, this is impossible, but not with God. All things are possible with God. So the crazy thing is, to this rich young man, it was his money that was creating friction. It was his money that was allowing him to so easily disobey, to so easily disengage with God, with Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit. So calling you out, what is it that allows you to so easily disobey? What is it that allows you to disengage when God gives you a call, when God places a vision, or gives you a purpose of something to do? And it could be day by day by day. What is it that allowed you to ignore the piece of trash that you walked by that you felt like you should have picked up? Because you see, the things that God will call you to do, the things that God will place on your heart, we cannot determine one greater than the other because anything that Father, that Abba places on your heart or that speaks to you to do is just important as picking up that piece of trash as it is traveling across the world to do something for him. It's obedience that Christ wants. Oh, just, just obedience. And the crazy thing is, is when we obey our Father, we experience more of his love because he actually knows what he's doing. <laughs> True story, right? He knows what he's doing. I know it. So then Peter spoke up. We left everything to follow you. Truly I tell you, then Jesus, 
No one who has left home, and this is huge, Jesus replied, no one who has left home or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or fields for me and the gospel will fail to receive a hundred times as much in this present age. Homes, brothers, sisters, mothers, children, fields. And this is where it's going to get intense. It's kind of like, well, that's cool. We're going to receive all, you know, we're going to receive it all back. But then God goes on to say, and in the, oh, along with persecutions. Because we think that we should be able to step into a purpose, step into a calling, or step into a vision with God's grace, his liberation, his redemption, his power, and his blood without going through persecutions, without going through hard times. But you see again to back up that if the calling or the vision is not intimidating, then it's an insult to God. Because without faith, it is impossible to do what? Without faith, it is impossible to do what? So from faith to faith, through, pro- through persecutions, through hard times, you stand upon your faith. God gives you a calling, gives you a purpose, and it takes faith to stand up and do that. I guarantee you there are some mornings where it takes faith just to get up and open your eyes and pull your pants on because of, of how your life is at the moment. And then it's going to take this much more faith to go to work and be nice to everybody at work. And then it's going to take even more faith to come home and be patient with your wife and your kids. Because let's be honest, sometimes you come home from a hard day's work, and you're like, I just need to go back to work so I can rest. I mean, let's just be honest, right? So from faith to faith to faith to faith, it takes faith. You've got to have faith, faith, faith. That's a good song. I'm about to start rocking out. That's chili peppers, right? Yeah. So check this out. So moving on. If you want to do it Christ style, and I'm going to beat this thing like it's a dead horse, it's going to cost you everything, but the benefits are too great Good. to calculate. Good work. Good work. There is no way in the world that I can even begin, I mean, I can try to tell you how much God loves you. I can try to tell you how much God will forgive you. I can try to tell you all the benefits that you'll receive through being obedient in Christ and being obedient in calling and following his vision and his purpose and his calling in your life. But the minute I start to apathetically or to, to cat, well, apathetically speak about that, my speech becomes capathetic. It, it fails. You can't describe God's love. You can try. <laughs> try to explain virgin birth. <laughs> See, God is not only, he's, God is so powerful that he's actually power. Try to, so see, I'm trying to, to figure out a way to, to, but I can't. He's just too vast. So Romans 8, go to Romans 8. We're going to be in 18 through 39. Man, a good preacher would have had this mark so I had to flip around and make you guys wait. But I can make you guys wait because it ain't all about you. <laughs> or it's all about me either. <laughs> so Romans 8, 18, and this is huge. This, is, this gets good. So I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. For the creation waits in eager expectation for the children of God to be revealed. For the creation was subjected to frustration, this life, because there will be frustrations. Even in following God's purpose, His will, the calling upon your life, there's going to be frustrations. That's just the way that it is. For the creation was subjected to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the freedom and glory of the children of God. Without faith, without God, the frustrations will eat you up. But see, those frustrations are loud in your life, so you can stand upon God. In your weaknesses, strength is perfected. That's the word of God that Papa D was talking about. So see, we've been subjected to all these frustrating times, but God allows that because he wants you to draw near to him, James 4 eight. So accept those things and then draw near to God. We know that the whole creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. Not only so, but we ourselves groan inwardly as we eagerly await for our adoption to sonship, for the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we were saved, but hope that is seen is no hope at all. Who hopes for what they already have? But if we hope for what we do not yet have, we wait for it patiently. In the same way the Spirit helps us in our weakness, we do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us through wordless groans, and he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit. Because the Spirit intercedes for God's people in accordance to the will of God. And this is going to get huge, and we'll kind of keep coming back to this. 
And we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who called, who have been called according to his purpose. So seven months ago, I had this dream. And it's one of those dreams that is so vivid that you can feel, you can hear. Like when you wake up, you swear that you weren't actually asleep, all right? So I'm in this huge, Casey would have loved this tree. I'm in this huge pine tree, okay? And it's like the rut, so who knows what time it is. This is like one of the very few churches I can come and talk about the rut. And people are like, I know what he's talking about. Other churches are like, what is that? <laughs> but praise God, this church knows what it means. Whack, okay? So anyways, I'm in this huge pine tree. And I could feel like I just knew that it was on. And all of a sudden I hear all this breaking and all this noise. And I, I just know I'm getting ready to hear it. But all of a sudden, out popped this little bitty bear. And I'm like, what in the world? And so this little bear comes out. And then behind it is another bigger bear. And then I still hear all this noise and this growling and stuff. And out behind that bear popped this just nasty, evil, mean, like I could feel the hair on my neck stand up. He was just that evil. And this bear began to chase the other bears. And ended up killing one of the big bears, and the little bear got away. I'm not telling about goalie loss. This is actually something happened to my head, okay? <laughs> so he was like, wow. <laughs> so anyways, then after it killed that bear, it looked up at me and started coming up the tree. And I drew my bow back, and I shot, it, shot the bear right in the head, okay? And it was kind of, you ever had one of those dreams where you're fighting somebody, but you feel like you can't fight? Or you're drowning, and you feel like you can't swim? So the arrow just kind of goes, it's like, seriously? Well, then I remember turning around, and behind me, there was a huge building. And then all of a sudden, I had this, like, this feeling inside of my heart that I had to get inside of this building to warn the people that were in the building about this bear that was trying to get in the building. Okay? So then I ended up crawling out on this branch, jumping on top of the building, and finding a way in. And when I get inside the building, I met this girl that I, I didn't know what she looked like or anything. The only thing that vividly stood out was she had a tattoo of a lighthouse on her arm. This is huge, okay? So then we're running around upstairs in this hallway trying to get downstairs to where all the people are at. And we finally end up down there, and all the people are was like, were like of a, an Asian ethnic background, a bunch of Asian girls, boys, just all Asians. And all of a sudden, to my right, that big, giant, nasty, evil barrel just, just, bear just pops up and is running through people just shredding them. I'm talking demolishing them. And I remember looking to my left, and this huge door opens up, and it was so bright and so radiant that I couldn't even, I just remember I couldn't even look at it, but I knew that we had to get all these people through that doorway. So then we're kind of funneling people out and trying to get them to run out, and I remember just turning back, and that bear was right in my face, and he just whoo, went to swipe me, and I remember ducking, and it was, but I could like feel the wind of it, I could smell him, it was just that vivid. Well, then I ended up turning and running, and See, I'm 35. I used to have these things called an erector set with nuts and bolts. You'd build cool things with them, right? And it's what it kind of looked like, so I started climbing it. And right before the top, there was a little bitty girl, and she was, stand, she was just sitting down, and she had her hands over her face. And I remember just trying to frankly get to her. And right before I get to her, that bear popped up above her and just ripped her in half. I mean, just vivid, just <laughs> ripped her in half. So then I ended up jumping off the deal, back down it, I remember the bear was on me again, and I was running from that bear, but not, it wasn't from like a, a point of fear or being afraid, but I was strategically getting into place to defeat the bear. Make sense? Okay, so moving on. So check this out, and we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him and who have been called according to his purpose. For what? His purpose. For God foreknew for those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. And those he predestined, he also called. Those he justified, he also glorified. Who in here wants to be justified? Who in here needs to be glorified? This guy does every single day. Every single day. Every single day. So moving on. Hebrews 12, 29, for our God is a consuming fire. Huge verse. 2 Timothy 1, 6, fan into flame the gift of God. Our faith is meant to be exercised from faith to faith to faith. From purpose to calling, from purpose to calling. Because truth be told, whatever God calls you or reveals you to do today, 
the following day, he could completely call and ask to do something completely different, but will you listen? Will you obey? Or what is it about your relationship that will allow you to so easily disobey? Maybe that guy across the street that's loud, obnoxious, and unruly, that you don't like and you really don't care too much about. Maybe one day you see him out there and he's trying to fix his car and he's complaining because he has no money. What if God called you to walk across that street and say, hey, I want to pay to get this car fixed? Who's to say that he won't? And then who's to say that taking a step farther, you won't be like, well, I can't do that because I just don't have enough money. How big is God? What is it about your relationship that allows you to so easily disobey him? Because you know, and I know, that when God speaks to you intimately and he asks you to do something, normally it's like this. Like, okay, okay, right? But then sometimes we disengage and we draw back and we quench the spirit. So Matthew 13, 44, the kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field. When a man found it, he hid it again, and then in his joy went and sold all that he had to buy that field. Because that man knew that his identity, that his purpose, that his calling, that his deity, that everything is found where? His deity, his embodiment, his purpose, his calling, everything about him is found where? Just in God just in him. That is it. Not in what you do, not in how you do, not in how you get there, not as if you get there, but it's only found in God. So moving on. So see, it's going to cost you everything, and this message is going to build. It's going to get a little more intense. So Matthew 4, 18, 22, as Jesus was walking beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon called Peter, and his brothers Andrew. They were casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Come follow me, Jesus said, and I will send you out to fish for people. At once they left their nets and followed him. Going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John. They were in a boat with their father. Who in here has a dad? Some of them went on to be home, I understand that. What if you're with your dad, Scott, and he was having you work for him, build fence, hay, something, and all of a sudden, your buddies pull up and say, hey, come with me. And you just completely dropped everything and took off. Yeah. <laughs> Y'all know what happened to me. And see, to take it farther, these were fishermen. See, Zebedee was a fisherman. That's how they provided for their family. That's what their identity was hidden. Everything. So when Jesus Christ says, come on. And they just, so see you later, Dad. I'm checking out. Huge. Do you know how intimidating, how just to think about that, how huge that would have been being a teenager and you're just going to drop everything, your whole identity, your whole way of life, saying, okay, Dad, you can take care of the family. You're going to catch all the fish. You're going to pay for everything. But you know what? God's called me to do this, so adios. Yes. See, that's what it's going to be like. It's going to cost you everything, but the benefits are far too great to calculate. Ezekiel 2230, I looked for someone among them who would build up the wall and stand before me in the gap on behalf of the land so I would not have to destroy it. But God says what? I found no one. And these were the chosen people. These were after they're led out of Egypt. Shekinah cloud of glory, Red Sea party. All of these things. Why do you think he couldn't find no one? Do you think there was some disobedience going on? Do you think there was a little bit of friction? Who in here, marriage is real good if you don't talk to your wife or husband. Does friction come in there? And often my food don't start, food don't taste very good if food is even being made, you know. Because there's friction. There's no communication. There's disobedience. So again, what is it about your relationship with Christ that allows you to so easily disobey him? Or honestly, to take it a step farther, I just thought about this mind blown. What is it about your relationship with Christ that allows you not to hear a calling or that allows you not to receive a purpose? Because see, God can't give you something or show you something until you're ready to step into that. For that would not be how God works. For whatever God calls you to do and he predestines you to do, he's prepared you to handle it. Because one thing that God does do with us is he trusts his children and when he brings you to something he's going to bring you through it no matter what god's trying to get your attention and this is huge don't seek god out in others don't look for someone to help you to become more intimately connected to god don't look for someone to teach you more about god it's kind of crazy okay i very much believe in having paul's my life this man right here is the biggest Paul in my life. Um, so I'm not saying not to do that. But what I am going to say is this right here. And you can't argue with the word. You can't play fast and loose with this text because it is God's word. 
1 John 2, 27, As for you, the anointing you receive from him remains in you, and you do not need anyone to teach you. But as his anointing teaches you about all things, and as that anointing is real and not counterfeit, just as it has taught you, remain in him. See, ultimately, it has to be about you and Jesus Christ. If he's going to give you a calling, if he's going to place a purpose on your life, if you're not making it all about him, then you won't last. You'll wash out. You can't ride anybody's shirt tails to heaven. It is about you and Jesus Christ because he's where you receive your anointing. He's where you receive wisdom. I'm not saying that you can't have other people give you direction, but just like when the boys jumped out of the boat, had they looked at that and said, like, well, Dad, you know, Jesus called me over here, so I think we're going to have to. Do you think he'd be like, oh, yeah, son, I'll do all this. I'll take care of all this. You go ahead. Right? So it's about being strictly obedient to Jesus Christ and what he has called you to do. And you will know that. Just like Scotty said, if you're seeking him and you're looking and you're asking, God's going to show you. I guarantee he'll show you. So see, we compartmentalize the areas that we allow God to work in our lives. God, you can have my morals. You can have my finances, maybe. You can even take care of my family, but let's just stay out of me. Okay, let's leave that aside. Let's not be intentional about getting inside of me and revealing past wounds, past hurts, because you have to just, ugh. See, it's all or nothing. He doesn't want just some of you, but he wants all of you. And again, this is building. So see, we should always seek to enter into an uninterrupted relationship with Jesus Christ. We have to be courageous in this effort to lay down our everything for Christ. See, being courageous isn't going to remove the fear. But what it's like, it's like umbrella keeps the rain from hitting you. See, it covers you. See, choose to focus on Christ and keep your eyes fixed upon him. Because he's wanting to give you a purpose. He's wanting to give you vision. He's wanting to place a calling upon your life. But he can't reveal or show that again until you're ready, right? Because he's going to show you something. See, you can't really live until you really die. Even when we don't want God, he wants us. When we don't love him, God still loves us. He delights in us. Two years ago, I was in a place where I was telling God to go straight to hell. That I still very much believed in the power and the vastness and the majesty of God. I believed all that. But I was telling him, I want nothing to do with you. I'm tired of the pain. I'm tired of the frustrations. I'm tired of being hurt. So just leave me alone. And he did nothing but just seek me out. He never, ever, I dug so far into a cave that I actually think I made it out the other way. And he followed me the whole time, which was beautiful. So see, choose to enter into the depths of God's love every day. I have been transfixed by his beauty and transformed by his love. And that's what he wants to do. He wants to make it so much about you and him that when that vision or when that calling or that purpose comes into your face, and you're like, man, that's whoo. But again, if it's not intimidating and it doesn't scare the hell out of you, then it's an insult to God. So have you even been seeking that out? Have you even been daring to ask God what, you, what he wants from you? Have you even done that? When's the last time you literally had a face-to-face with God and asked him, what, what is it that you want me to do for you? Yeah. See, it's funny. Some people will, you always hear about people wanting more and people wanting more so they get into this Bible study or they get into that Bible study or they get into that. And I'm not saying that's bad because that's good. But then I'm thinking, when's the last time you just listened to God tell you to do something? Do something. When's the last time? Because I promise you, there's going to be times when you pull up to Walmart and there's shopping carts everywhere. And God's like, why don't you take all these shopping carts and push them back open to people? Because God will ask you to do some of the things you think is so small, but he's trying to build your obedience and allegiance. Yeah. So see, we can no longer trust our own assessment of ourselves, but rather more we dare to take the gamble on what our Father thinks of us. We must seek to understand the vastness of God's beauty from our brokenness. See, nothing will, and I don't know where you're at again, but nothing's ever so dead that God cannot grow something living in it. And this is huge because if you've become so familiar just to go into church, so, and this is all good stuff. I remember one time Clayton and I come in here and rearrange this whole place. Yeah. And that morning people come in here and they were, they were mad. But it was beautiful, baby, because familiarity breeds contempt and complacency. And God don't want you to be complacent. We're not meant to be complacent. Life within the comfort zone is life outside of God's will. From faith to faith. That it's going to take this much faith to do that. So God brought that to you. So now rely on your daddy's grace, power, strength, and mercy. And the redemption of Jesus Christ's blood. And get closer with him. Learn to stand upon him. Because if life is just easy, breezy, beautiful cover girl. And you're coming here and sitting down. 
don't lie to yourselves and fool yourselves and think that you're going to even begin to understand the vastness and the power of God because you've never stepped outside of the comfort zone. You're in a little bubble. At the same time, too, though, I will say this. If you, and this is huge. This is a, I'm very, very serious about this because this is where I fell prey to. When I first became a Christian at 19, it was 110 mile an hour. Tell the world that Jesus lives. I never even understood what it meant to be a son of God. I became so much about doing kingdom work that the mission became before the man. And that can't happen because you will not, sus- you will not sustain. So there's that, that balance. It's always, and God will allow rest. He'll give you those times where you're just supposed to sit and you're just supposed to rest and bask in his presence and just be a son. Because truly and honestly, no matter if you're out snatching souls from hell or no matter if you're sitting right here, God is just as pleased with you and he loves you just as much. So don't fall prey to those lies of the devil. Um, yep. Flip side of that is the book of Revelation says you're going to be a judge and held accordingly to what you do. So what are you going to do? <laughs> There's an open seat beside you. Why is it open? You know what I'm saying? So what are you going to do to consider the open chair? <laughs> right? So moving on. So see, we're in hostile territory. This is where it's going to get crazy. It's going to get awesome. I'm going to love it. This isn't a time to be complacent. The ancient Hebrews had this crazy war cry. And it was a, this war cry because they knew that there was a battle going on. And they knew that there were Christians on the battlefield lying and dying and bleeding out. They knew that. So see, the ancient Hebrews developed this war cry, this rock, and it's Hazak Amatz. And this is huge. So check this out. So Chazak is the rock-like oomph of the spiritual zealous heart, the game face of a mighty man, tenacity of soul, the gritting of the teeth of the spirit-inspired warrior, and the bearing of those teeth to the enemy. When's the last time that you've just gotten Satan's face and told him to go to hell? When's the last time that God actually called you so strongly to do something where you had to grit your daggum teeth to get through and be obedient? It is possessing a resolute and growling resolve for the glory of God, a flush of spiritual fervor, a tensing of a soldier's muscles. Do you have this spiritually? See, we should have this. It's everything we need for life and godliness has been awarded to us already. Yeah. That's the Chazak. Yeah. So now, rock Chazak, it came from Chazak and Mots in the Bible. The other word that goes with it is Amats. What is Amats? And this is cool. Amats is the heavenly audacity it's being audacious just in waking up and stepping your feet up and saying i'm a big deal because god's my daddy that's what it is it's realizing how big of a deal you truly are and that god has a purpose he has a calling are you going to be audacious to step into that because it's going to scare the hell out of you and it's meant to scare the hell out of you because why because you're supposed to draw closer to god through that right it's rushing headlong into the most hazardous in impossible battles without pausing, not even going, huh? not, yeah, not even none of that, to consider the impossibilities. It's a confidence in the victory even before the field is taken. So see, there's going to be hard times in your life, but God has allowed that. Remember right back to the word that we were building on? What did it say? And we know that in all things, God works for the what? So the word is living and active, right? And you believe in the word? So even before the battle... You already know victory is there. So will you audaciously rush straight in to take the field even before? What did it talk about hope again? Do we hope for things we already have? Don't make no sense, does it? So check this out. It's a confidence in victory even before the field is taken. It's lambs moving. You rise and rise again until lambs become lions. It's lambs moving with liquid ferocity straight into the lion's lair. It means swift-footed, all-believing, all-believing, super conquering, prevailing faith in the Lord of battles. Yeah, good word. So who had him watch the Bible? David. Yeah. Who here knows when David steps up to kill Jack Stick Goliath, yeah. he picked up five rocks. Five rocks right? Do we know why he picked up five rocks? Yeah. David had four brothers. <laughs> See, that's audacious. That's tenacious. Yes, Goliath had four brothers. That's audacious. That's tenac- tenacious. And see, the crazy thing is, is we think about David, and a lot of people say that he was unskilled and untrained. Mm-mm. The whole time before Goliath, what was bro doing? Killed him. He was training. Nobody knew it. 
Because he wasn't boasting and bragging. He was just being one with God. God was giving him purpose. God was giving him vision. God was giving him calling. What was he doing? He was stepping into it. Do you think it was intimidating, intimidating to be a small shepherd boy in the face of a lion barehanded or a bear? Could that have been intimidating? Sure. Be honest, yeah. yeah. If the vision of the calling is not intimidating, it's an insult to God. Mm. Then when that moment come, when the stage was laid, bare before everybody, and everybody shaked and shuddered and ran, David says, huh, I don't want your, your armor. I don't need that. Where was his armor at? And he stepped up to the plate and lopped off giant, lopped off Goliath's head, right? And then beyond that, he had four more rocks to take out the other ones. See, that's a mox. Then you have three that overheard David in the cave of Adullam. Remember David flees and hides in this cave? He was thirsty and talked about having a drink of water. So three of his mighty men hear that, and he didn't even tell them to go do it. But these three mighty men rushed audaciously through all the Philistines, get a cup of water, and it's not enough to get through them to get that cup of water, but then they fought all the way back through everybody. Right. With, that's, go back, read this. No, go back, go back. Check this out. It means swift-footed, all-believing, super-conquering, prevailing in the faith of the Lord of Battles. And then even to back up a little bit farther, it's confidence in the victory even before the field is taken. Do you think those men had confidence in that? Why do you think they were able to do it? I'm sure it was intimidating, but they stepped out, right? right? Moving on. Natural law, this is what has happened with Christians, because we've allowed ourselves to become domesticated. We've allowed ourselves to come in and passively, quietly sit right here right. and just to allow familiarity to breed contempt all over the place. And I'm not attacking nobody because, trust me, I'm somebody that, 35, I forgot how almost old I was, but I've lived a lot of life, not to boast or brag, and I have failed miserably, and I have sinned very, very good, but I'm also liberated, so I can throw a party rock on. So natural law has invaded the heavenly law, and it's completely backwards. See, natural law says with man, it is impossible. And you're right. The things that God is going to ask of you, the things that God is going to reveal and show you, will be impossible. You won't make it if you just stand upon, uh-uh, you will not make it. So the fact of heavenly law is this, that with God all things are possible. Choose to believe in the heavenly law because you see real gold fears no fire. And that's what you all are. Does everybody believe in Christ in here? Who believes that Jesus Christ is the Son of the living God? Who believes that Jesus Christ rose on the third day? Who believes that you're forgiven and liberated from all your sins? So then you're real gold. Just to just clear that up. You see, difficulty and challenges and the impossible give God the chance to show up and show off. When David stood forward and he threw that stone, do you think David was thinking all about himself? He was giving God a chance to show up and show off. When Moses stepped forward, he was giving God a chance to show up and show off. When Daniel walked into the den of lions, he gave God the chance to show up and show off. The crazy thing is, all those men, I don't know if you guys know this or not, but theologically speaking, and this is the truth, fact, matter of fact, matter of fact, it's a fact, mind blown right here, get ready. Free death, burial, and resurrection, all those men don't have what we have. Yeah. Right. Right. Now, post, boom, Acts, day of Pentecost, bam, Holy Spirit, come into us, live in us, and invade every part of us. Right. So, do you want to get to heaven and have David or Moses or Daniel sit down beside you and be like, man, what was it like? Did, did you have the Holy Spirit inside of you? What'd you do with it? I came to church and I sit down. Yeah, I don't know, right? But that's the truth, right? So the fact that the natural has been invaded by the heavenly law and God works in the supernatural as it pleases, not as we please, is about his will, his purpose, not ours. And I will beat it again. God has a purpose. He has a calling. He has a plan for your life that you haven't even begun to step into. God still has a plan and a vision and a calling upon my life that I haven't even begun to step into. Now, from faith to faith, as he gives me callings, as he gives me purpose, as he gives me visions, I'm going to praise God and ask him for the faith, ask him for the strength to step into what he calls me to step into. But that's as he guides. That's as he directs. See, we're built to lay down our life, and this is huge. This is from when I was a little boy. So the Cheyenne Dog Soldiers, anybody know about them? Radical rank dudes. They're like the special forces of the Cheyenne. These guys were bred and born to die. That was their purpose. Over all the Cheyenne Indians, 
They had dog soldiers. It's like a secret service type of deal. They were literally bred and born to die, to lay down their life. That's what their calling was. So you would have them in a battle situation, highly trained, highly skilled. These are the dudes that would like hang off the horses with their foot on their neck and like, I mean, you know, rank. But during a battle, what they would do, and there is no name for this. I wish they, maybe there is somewhere I said they'll find it ever. But they would take a rope and tie it to their foot and then take a stake and stick it in the ground. And then during battle, they were meant to die so all the women and children could get away. Even the old, even the old people. They held their ground. They didn't back up. Audacious. Amats. They were bred and born to die, to lay down their life. Kind of speaks to us as Christians, right? Because ultimately, we have to die. And that's the beautiful picture of bapti- being baptized, right? I mean, it is. It's, a, it's very significant of laying down and dying to yourself and then raising again. I mean, that's huge. Receiving the Holy Spirit, all of it. I mean, it's huge. We are meant to die and lay down our lives, that Christ would be revealed and glorified. So the Cheyennes and Drosnamoy, to show oneself a man to be, to prove oneself a brave-hearted man, to demonstrate strength in the day of adversity, to stand up and be a warrior. That is beautiful. Valley le pena. The pain is worth it. The Colombian church, when it was birthed, massive persecution. I'm talking massive. Hands being lopped off, people being rolled over with steamrollers, kids being killed in front of their parents, kids being ripped apart by animals. Massive persecution for saying you're Christians. So what they did is they developed this saying as they would walk, this is huge, as they walked by each other. The pain is worth it. Keep going. Amats, amats. Be audacious in your faith. Don't stop. You see, when all hell breaks loose, this is huge. When things get thin, when things get hard, realize this that all of heaven has been broke loose for you. All of heaven is released to you. The angels, God, the Holy Spirit, every bit of it is at your side. He's not just in front of you. He's behind you. He's all around you. That's huge. Vow the pain and the pain is worth it. Keep going. Don't stop. A Christian isn't proven in times of comfort, but more so in times of uncomfort. So here's the question. Are you willing to risk everything? Are you willing to be a gambler, a daredevil for God? Are you really, truly ready to trust Him? Are you ready for God to give you a purpose? Are you ready for God to show you a calling or to give you vision? Are you ready for that? Because again, it doesn't mean that He's going to send you across the world. It could mean that you're just meant to start talking to your neighbor that you don't talk to, that you stick your nose about, that you act like some white-collared Christian. I don't know. I don't know what, I know what God right now, I know what God has called and asked of me, okay? But for you, I don't know that. But I do know this, the cool thing is that when you do step outside of the comfort zone and you follow him, it's crazy how, and again, God loves you sitting here just as much if you're, because there will be times of rest. But when you truly are obedient to what God has called you to do, the love that you feel from him, the the embrace of just crawling up on his knee, Abba, Father, um, it's beautiful. I can't even begin to describe it. Um, Huge. So Christians wanted for hazardous duty to the cross. This is huge, and it kind of, to me, it, it just speaks to me, all right? So men wanted for hazardous journey, small wages, bitter cold, long months of complete darkness, constant danger, safe return doubtful, honor and recognition in case of success. Sir Ernest Shackleton in the the late 1800s, the very first men to ever take an expedition in the Antarctica, that's what he put in the newspaper to recruit men. (laughs) And it's kind of like, man, think about the day you become a Christian. It's all kind of, and I'm not attacking nothing, but it's all easy, breezy, and the snap. People are like, who's ready to die? Who's ready to step across this line and die? Who's ready to lay down their life? Who's ready to become completely selfless? Who's ready to examine the inner things that they deal with, the sin, the wounds, the pains, the hurts, the traumas? Who's ready to do that? Because come on, accept Jesus Christ because that's what he's about. He's about ripping your flesh off of your flesh and dying to him. How many people would walk forward for that? (laughs) Because, man, so moving on. It will feel as if we are outmanned, outgunned, outlawed. 
That's sometimes what it will feel like. Who's in? Are you ready to be put on Satan's hit list? Because that's what's going to happen. Guarantee it. There's a target on your back and Satan wants to get it. And often, people will receive a calling or a vision, and the people around them won't agree. That's why you'll feel like you're outmanned and outgunned, and like you're an outlaw. Because the thing that God calls you to do, again, it's meant to make you uncomfortable. It's meant to draw you closer to him. It's meant to create an allegiance and an obedience. So there are going to be times that there are going to be people that don't agree with what God has called you to do. And I would challenge you with this, as long as it aligns to Scripture, you look at those people and say, get behind me, Satan. If you can stand in good, sober judgment and look at yourself and you know you've been seeking Christ and you know that God is calling you to do this, then own it and be audacious about it because God will bless that. His word tells us that he'll bless anything your hands touch. Do you believe that? That's his word. Remember, all hell will break loose when you stand for Christ. But all of heaven is broken loose to sustain you. And it's going to feel like you're surrounded. Just realize that you're surrounded by him and step into that calling, step into that vision. That's how we fight our battles. 2 Samuel 19, 1 through 8. This is huge because I can't really get into to all of it, but I can get into enough of it to where this last year I've really, really um, identified with this text. Um, so 2 Samuel 19, just to kind of set the phrase, to paraphrase it real fast, what is going on is King David, his son, started basically undermining him, okay? And basically, David's men are responsible for Absalom's death. So David finds himself in just this spirit of anguish, probably mad, probably bitter, probably angry. Where are you, God? But then if we flip back, what did it say earlier? that God works for the good of those that love him, that God works for the good through all things. So you have this moment where David kind of was almost in opposition, like, man, I don't know if I can step up to my purpose. I don't know if I can step back up into my position. Because right now, God, it don't feel good. It don't feel like this is your purpose. It don't feel like this was was where I was supposed to be. It don't feel like this is what was supposed to be going on because I followed you here. I did this. I did that. And now look where I'm at. My son is dead. And I'm the one that's pretty much responsible for that. So David started... He started to kind of, like, withdraw a little bit, honestly. And his men came to him and reminded him, probably out of love. What Proverbs tells us is the wounds of a friend are faithful. So then David does something so profound. When he hears this and he starts thinking about it, this is what David does. He goes back to thinking about who he is. You see, the scariest things in this world, well, what is the scariest thing in this world to you? Is it Satan, monsters, scary movies, dark? I'll tell you what the most scariest thing in this world is, and you'll agree with me, because it scares the hell even out of Christians. The most scariest thing in this world is a man or woman that's been appointed by God, that's been anointed by God, called by God, and this is the most important one. This is what you have to get right. Say have to. to. Say have to again. Say it one more time for me. Because I need to make sure that I have to have to get you to know this because this is the biggest, the most important one. You have to know who you are in God. Your deity, you have to know that. So David goes back to thinking. I know who I am. I know what you've called me to do. I believe in that. And David starts stepping back. He starts stepping back. And it says it so profoundly right here. So king, the king got up and he took his seat in the gateway. See, David reminded himself what his purpose, what his position was. And he's back in purpose. He's back in position. Through hell, through turmoil, through wrong turns after wrong turns, he realigned his heart back with what God had called him to do. So he took his seat. He's back in purpose, back in position. 
So again, what is it about your relationship with Christ that allows you not to be in purpose? What is it about your relationship with Christ that allows you not to be in position? Because if you're not in purpose and you're not in position, then only you know what that answer is. And for myself, like we put, I've put people on our board of advisors that are kind of like the devil's advocate to me. And I want that to check blind spots. Because I want to make sure that I'm staying in purpose and that I'm staying in position. And only me, I personally intimately know that. And yes, the ones that are closest around me, they're going to know that and check that off of my spirit like Papa D would know like that. He would just know. God would tell it to him in a dream and he would call me because that's how close we're connected. So are you in position? Are you in purpose? And this, that nightmare, I mean, become that nightmare because that's the scariest thing in the world. You see, I've always tried to live this life that doesn't cling to a chapel or church bell, but very much runs a rescue mission within the yards of hell. That's where I, and that's where God wants me, and that's where I'm the most safest at. And to some people, they might not agree and not understand, but I feel it. And that's what's important. Now, I'm not saying that God's not going to change that, that calling or that vision, but then I'll know because he'll, be, he'll say, hey, son, that's what will happen. So not less than just a week ago, I was running 30 mile an hour on a, a scooter. And uh, I was out of the country, and there was this huge, just gigantic roundabout. And I'm talking, there's tons of people coming and going, cars, scooters, nobody stops. 30 mile an hour. Everybody just moves like ants on crack. Which is perfect for me, okay? And Scotty would love it. So I'm, I'm, I'm coming to this roundabout, and I have a scooter up here in front of me, and like four or five, six or something behind me. Now we're all moving as kind of a pack. And out of nowhere, a, Les, a Lexus SUV, big one, hit me at 30 mile an hour. And he was, I mean, he was moving. And I seen it coming, and I remember jumping. And even before I tucked and rolled up, because I've been thrown off a of bull after bull, wrecked motorcycles. I mean, so I kind of know how to wreck. But this, but this goes beyond that, okay? So I remember jumping up, and I just grinned. And I knew, even before I felt the impact, I knew what was going on. There's a backstory to all this because see satan won't stop but when he shows his ugly face i grin and i'm audacious that a mot it's like come on what are you gonna do because my god's got me even if this temporal life in, win or ends i still win i'll beat you guys there and be like see you later i'll catch when you guys come up so i'd be like adios so i tucked and i remember rolling on the hood and hitting the windshield and the guy Arr! and it was like you ever skip a rock on a pond Roll across the road. Do, 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 do. And I stood up and I jumped up. And I thought to myself, go to hell, Satan. Yeah. And I grinned and smiled and picked up my bike. And then that night, that bear that I talked about, that night that bear was killed. Yeah. Yeah. And see, it was all because that was the purpose. Yeah. That was the vision. That was the calling. And that was seven months. But right up until the wire, Satan never quit. So I have to be audacious. That a motz, that a motz. Because God has a purpose he has a calling, and he wants you guys to do something, something more than that, than what you've already accepted or done. Yeah. But again, I can't, seriously, I can't stress this enough, and I think it's because of how I got to where I was at, is I forgot, and I, maybe I never really realized it wasn't a revelation to me, just having that pure, uninterrupted, just, just sonship. That's truly what God wants. Right. So if you're not there today, and you truly don't know who you are in Christ, Man, get that right. And then God's either going to call you, like Papa D said, he's either going to call you across the street or across the world. Because that is, that is the mission of the cross. That's why Christ called the men. Come and I'll make you fishers of men. There's people right now, and even you could be one of those people, and if you are, then find somebody to pray with you. If not, heck, I'll, come, I'll talk to you for 52 hours if I have to. So if you're in this church today and you feel like you're bleeding and dying out, don't, don't leave here until you get that right, because that has to be right. Because ultimately, God has called all of his Christians to be warriors, every single one of them. Nobody's out of that. And again, whether it's across the street, whether it's in this town, in this county, in this state, in this country, or somewhere in the world, God has purpose, he has calling, and he wants to show it to you. The only way to find that is by seeking him. That is the only way. Holy Christ, I'm blown away by you. 
I'm embraced by you. We are all loved by you. Liberated and redeemed, God, we come to you. All of your creation is eagerly waiting, Father, till that day that you do call us home. And I can't wait, and I wouldn't complain if it happened right now, because I can be honest, the things that, that you've called, the things that you've asked, Father, at times they're hellish and at times they're hard. But the rockinest thing is, God, Father, I know you're with me. I know you're pleased. And I know that you're pleased with everybody in this building right now. I know that there's a specific reason that everybody's here, Lord. I know that you're speaking to people. I know that you're convicting people. I know that you're loving on all of us. So God, above everything, above everything, allow us just to step into that, that holy, holy place with you every single day, God. I don't even want to ask you to be with us because your word already says that you're with us. Your word already says that you'll never leave nor forsake us. So what I do ask God is that we would realize that. I do ask God that we would see you more every day, that we would seek you out, that we would hear you in our lives, that we would experience you in our lives, that we would know that you're right there with us day by day, Father. God, I thank you for uh, Westside. I thank you for this being my home, for the people uh, for the love and the embracement that, that we get through through this church, through your people. Um, I ask that you be with us, God. Uh, continue to remind us that you, that you are there. Uh, we love you and praise you. For in the holy, righteous Christ's name I pray, amen.